Well, it feels like today that we are in some ways uh, closing out a chapter. You guys ever read a good book and you finish a chapter and things are coming to a conclusion? Certainly, uh, this isn't the end of the story. <clears throat> there is 2 Samuel, but uh, it is a, a good day to, to close out this chapter of Iron Man and this chapter of 1 Samuel. Um, it has been a wonderful time going through it with you all. I've learned a lot. I do want to say uh, in introduction that words are important. Words are important. Certainly our own individual words are important, right? Any, uh, any of you guys out there who are married knows this, right? Your words are important. Uh, but beyond that, there is a reality that words have an ability, a power to even change the world. There are some words that, uh, when once said or written, become historical, and they can change and form history. That even after they have been spoken or written, their power continues to reverberate in the hearts and minds of people for centuries. Uh, I was thinking of the Declaration of Independence Um, And I read through that yesterday. I don't know if any of you guys have ever read through that. It's worth your time. Uh, I think really when we consider words that have been spoken, um, maybe in some degree those words have impacted our modern world in, in some ways more than others, more than any other maybe potentially. The last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, I'm going to read it for you. It states, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power, power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to, all other, and to do all other th- acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, notice that, that's going to make its way into our sermon today, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. Now, aren't you guys so glad that we are beneficiaries of those words that were wrote down for us in some 250 years ago about. Uh, There is, though, and for uh, no matter how patriotic we are and how much we love our country, and there is a prayer of mine that those words will continue to reverberate through history for, for many years, there is a reality and a pill that we need to swallow, and that is this, that there is coming a time in the history of the world that those famous words will become irrelevant. They will become irrelevant. Contrasting to that is God's eternal and unmovable word which never ceases and never fails. I'm going to read through a few scripture passages. First, we see that God's word is immovable. Unmovable. First Peter chapter 1 states, All flesh is like grass in its glory, like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Not just for a little time, but forever. Psalm 119 and verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Luke 16, Jesus himself says, it is easier 
for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. God's word is unmovable. Furthermore, God's word is inevitable. Psalm 135, verse 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas, in all the deeps. He does whatever he pleases, and it will come to pass. Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, a wonderful section of verses. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. Right? You almost sense the emphasis there. I am God, and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. It is inevitable, it will happen, and it is unavoidable. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. We cannot stand against his plan. We cannot stand against his word or his purposes. And so finally, one last verse, Proverbs 21, 30. No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. Now, this is a reminder to us that God is in control. He is sovereign over this whole world this earth, the created order. He is guiding and directing all things that come about. And we as believers then can have confidence in that, right? We can look at what he does. We can trust in the fact that he is in control. He accomplishes all those purposes, but it also serves as a warning. It is both an an encouragement and a warning lest we stand against God's word. But what we're going to see today in 1 Samuel is God is accomplishing and fulfilling the word that he has spoken both to David and to Saul numerous times throughout this book of 1 Samuel. And you guys will know that because you've walked with me through this journey, walking through 1 Samuel, that, that God has rejected Saul. He has despised him and he has said, I am taking away your throne. I am rejecting you. I'm giving it to another. And so God is accomplishing those purposes and those ends. Furthermore, he is establishing David as this chosen king, this anointed one, And God is going to raise him to the throne. He he is preparing the way for him to go there. And that's what we will see today. God's promises, even at times when they seem far-fetched, are not difficult to accomplish in his hand. I think a key theme for us today is God uses means, often unforeseen and altogether unavoidable to establish his perfect plan. He does that. He establishes his perfect plan in in unforeseen and unavoidable ways. He does that. And we're going to see that for these two men, for both David and Saul. It's a contrast. We'll walk through two chapters today. One chapter devoted to, to David and what's going on in David's life. The other chapter, 31, happening really concurrently at the same time, focused on Saul. And the Lord is fulfilling his word, which will not fail for both of these men. That's what we're seeing. And so... With that, I've titled our our passage and our sermon today, Triumph and Tragedy from Above. Triumph and Tragedy from Above. Because David is experiencing triumph at the hand of the Lord, and Saul, likewise, is experiencing tragedy from the hand of the Lord. Okay, with that, let's get into the text. Actually, let's, let's pray. We'll get into the text. Lord, I ask that you would just guide us today, direct us as we look towards your word. Allow us to see and understand, to hear and apply it to our lives. Illuminate us by the power of your spirit. And we thank you 
for how you have spoken to us in these two chapters. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, beginning in chapter 30, triumph from above. This is the triumph of David. It is triumph because God has strengthened and confirmed his hand. Now, if you're just joining us, the background for this chapter and really understanding where we are at, we have to go back and we have to ask, well, who's David and what's been happening to him? Well, David is the anointed king of God, 1 Samuel 16. Samuel anoints him to be king. God has promised him that he would have the kingdom of Israel to rule over it. He will become the recipient of the future Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. God has promised to David, and he will promise there in 2 Samuel 7, just a short future from now, that from him would come the Messiah, and that there would always be a man to sit on his throne. But since the time that David was anointed, you know, really from chapter 18 on, that life has been horrible for David. He has one great thing happen in his life, or maybe I should say two. He is anointed be, to be king, and then he slays Goliath, and then right on the heels of that, it seems like there's one tragedy after the next in his life as he is fleeing, as he is running. He is a fugitive. And his... And his danger takes him so far that he is taking refuge in Philistine territories under the hand of this Philistine king, Achish, the king of Gath. It was there that Achish, in chapter 27, gave to David a, a town, a city named Ziklag, where David and his wives and the wives of the men who were with him, his comrades who gathered to him, were stationed. They were living there. And they lived there for over a year, a year and four months, chapter 27 says. And this was, in reality, like a wandering season in David's life. As he is living amongst the Philistines, I think even David would probably go, God, what are you doing? What should I do with my life? And maybe he's not following as closely to the Lord as he should in this moment. I think there's times in David's life where God seems super close and times where God doesn't seem super close. That, I think, was one of those seasons. But the Lord providentially delivered David out from alliance with the Philistines. You'll remember in chapter 29 that the Philistines were drawing in battle up against the Israelites. That's where we will go back and see them in verse 31. The Philistines are about to fight the Israelites and David was going to have to fight alongside the Philistines against his own kinsmen. And he was in that pretty pickle, if you will, not knowing what the Lord would do or how he would deliver him. But God delivered him out of that situation because the commanders of the Philistines army said, we will not have David to fight alongside of us, even though their king Achish said, I want him to be my bodyguard. And so David and his men were delivered and they are allowed leave from the battle to return back to their hometown of Ziklag where their wives and their children are. And that brings us to the start of chapter 30. That is what's going on when we come right to the beginning of chapter 30. You will see in chapter 30, verse 1, Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day. Going back a few verses to chapter 29, you will see in verse 10, Now then, rise early in the morning, this is what was told to David, with, your, with the servants of your Lord who came with you, and start early in the morning and depart as soon as you have light. So David and his men set out, early in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines, but the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So David and his men now are on a journey from the Jezreel Valley back to Ziklag, about 60 miles, and certainly they would have joy in this journey. It is a multi-day journey, three days covering 60 miles, walking 20 miles a day in the company of 600 men, but they are overjoyed because they do not have to fight against their own people, their own kinsmen, and they get the joy of going back and seeing their wives and their children. You can imagine what it would be like for these warring Israelites to have leave of this battle and to go back to their families. There would have been anticipation, joy, and celebration. But when they get there, the bottom drops out from under them. 
and they arrive upon complete chaos. It says the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negeb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. Read verse three with me. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Now, is this a sight that you want to arrive home to? I, it, it would have been horrible. And there would have been great fear for their loved ones. As they arrive home, they're... they're Their home has been destroyed. Their wives and their children taken captive. Some may find it a mercy that the Amalekites didn't kill the captives. However, I think that what potentially awaited David's wives and children could have been worse than death itself. I think there's some things that maybe it's just better to die. What would have happened? Certainly their wives and daughters could have potentially Um, Had the Lord not intervened and protected them, they could have been raped. They would have been sold as slaves to the furthest corners of the known world, never to be seen or heard from again. Saul's, uh, not Saul's, David and his men's sons could have been killed or corrupted. And then there is compounded on top of all of this, the weight of guilt. This is maybe the greatest weight and burden that they've experienced so far. The air is taken out of them, knowing that had they been in their hometown, they could have prevented this entire unfortunate circumstances. And so there is a guilt that remains on them. And you'll know, you see in verse 1, who it was that did this. The Amalekites. Now, I think we know this because the reader is telling us, and the writer is telling us this, but I don't think David would have known this. The writer is letting us into something that David likely doesn't even know. And we know that this is not the first time we've seen the Amalekites in the story of 1 Samuel. Because you will remember in 1 Samuel 15, Saul was commanded to go and kill the Amalekites and devote them to complete destruction. And what had Saul failed to do? Well, he failed to do exactly that. And so what we are seeing is the cruelty of Saul's pity. He had pitied the Amalekites. He had not followed the commandment of the Lord. And this is... An outcome of that. There is a long history of antagonism between the Amalekites and the Israelites going all the way back to the wilderness wanderings just after the Exodus. And they arrive on the scene and there wouldn't have been a calling card. They wouldn't have left a calling card for David saying, hey, it was us, the Amalekites, come and get us. Right? David would not have known where they went, wouldn't know what to do, And his men are entirely, not only tired and beleaguered, but they are now disheartened. And so you read in verse 4, Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. If it's hard for you to imagine, put yourself in their shoes and imagine coming home to that scene. They wept until they had no more strength. This is despair that is so deep in pain that is so unbearable. It is great, great sorrow as they are looking at what has happened to their dear loved ones. What do David's men do? Well, certainly we read that David's wives also had been taken captive. And then it says in verse 6, And David was greatly distressed. Why? For the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. 
What we see about David and his men is that they were conspiring against him. And David, because of it, was rightly greatly in distress. They were thinking about stoning him. And isn't this consistent with human nature that we always look for a scapegoat, something upon which to lay our blame? And they saw David as the occasion for all of their calamity. David, if you hadn't made friends with these Philistines in trying to protect your life, we wouldn't have been obliged to follow them to draw up in battle against the Israelites. And we would have been here with our wives, our sons, and our daughters. And you are the cause of this. And so they conspire against him. David is greatly distressed. And, and it seems when you look at David's life, you might ask, man, how much can God's man take? It seems that he has been hunted and betrayed and handed over to death by even now his most loyal followers. Sometimes the Lord is close in at hand. Sometimes he is distant. He has lost his own wives and they are conspiring against him. How could God allow his chosen king to suffer in this way? That's a question you might be led to ask. How could God treat David like this? Well, gentlemen, I think it's important for us to know that being God's child does not mean that we have a free pass from suffering. In fact, because we are God's children, it might mean that in life we will receive a double portion of suffering. It is God's means of perfecting us. There's a promise. Jesus said in this world, you will have tribulation. And certainly if it was said of Christ who is the root and the descendant of David, it says of Christ in Hebrews chapter 2, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation, namely Jesus, perfect through suffering. That Christ was perfected through suffering. And so if that was true about Christ, is it not also true about David? That David is being perfected through this. He is being perfected through suffering. So David is not exempt from this lot. David is, I want you to picture it in your mind, he is on God's anvil. And he is being shaped. At the brink of catastrophe, right where God wants him. And how does he respond? Notice what he does. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And this is a contrast from Saul, because for Saul, when everything was going wrong in his life, what did he do? He chose what it was expedient, what was most beneficial for himself. It often acted impulsively. He consistently chose the easiest way out. Not David. I think there's a lesson for this uh, or for us in this. And it's that we cannot allow ourselves to cope with trials in despair by accessing alternative measures outside of God's already perfect provisions and comforts. I'm going to read that again. I think it's important. We cannot allow ourselves to cope with the trials and the despair that come upon us in our life by accessing alternative measures outside of God's already perfect provisions and comforts. So David then strengthens himself, not by other means, but strengthens himself in the Lord his God. This is not some superficial or superstitious mumbo jumbo. He's not hyping himself up in God in some religious fervor. That's also to say that he's not stifling his cries. Because I think those are there and they are real. But he allowed his sorrow to bring him to God. That he would be strengthened there. What does it mean to strengthen yourself in God? Well, I think we have to go back because there's really almost these same words are said of Jonathan in chapter 23, verse 16 and 17, who went and strengthened David's hand in the Lord. How did he do that? Well, he told David, you shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. So what did Jonathan do? He reminded David of the infallible promises of God. And thus we get triumph from above. 
because Jonathan strengthened David's hand by reminding David of God's infallible promises that never fail. So to strengthen ourselves, right? Because we are all put in a situation in life where sometimes we're, we need to strengthen our hand in God. How do we do that? We remind ourselves of God's infallible promises and perfect character and rest on those promises and rest on his character as it pertains to the trials and the sufferings that we experience in our own life. And here you see a contrast between David and his men, that instead of allowing the trial to get the best of him in his passions, David sets his heart to seek God in the moment of tragedy. I like what Matthew Henry says. He says, when David was at his wit's end, he was not at faith's end. Is that true? He sets his heart to seek the Lord. As always, I need to speed up, right? Verse 7. We got through six verses, guys. We're going there. <laughs> Verse 7. What does David do? He seeks the Lord. Here's another contrast from Saul. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. What is he doing here? Well, you will remember that numerous times throughout the book of 1 Samuel now, the will of the Lord has been discerned by the priest in using the ephod, this priestly garment, and the Urim and the Thummim that are connected to that. It is like an ancient form of casting lots to discern the will of the Lord. What's the importance of this? The importance of this is David is going to pursue and try to rescue his wives and his children and the wives of the children and uh, the wives and the children of the men who are with him only at the direction of the Lord, not at his own direction. And so he, he seeks the Lord. He inquires, shall I pursue? The Lord responds and he says, pursue for you shall surely overtake and you will surely rescue. It is interesting. God is not always obliged to answer us. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he won't. But the reality is he will always provide us with the grace that is sufficient to get through the trial, whether he answers us or not. I also see here that David is submitted to and dependent upon God. He's submitted because he's going, I'm not going to follow unless you tell me. And I'm dependent upon you for the success of the mission. I think there's another truth we can learn in this. And that is that our own strengths and capabilities, whatever they are, do not permit us to move where God is not first moving. Just because I'm gifted and capable in doing something doesn't mean that I'm supposed to go do it if God is not moving me there. And so he asks the Lord. And notice his men are willing to follow. So David set out and the 600 men who were with him and they came to the brook Besor. Now, this is a change of tune, is it not, from David's men? That they were just now conspiring to kill him and now they are following him. And to quote Matthew Henry again, he says, See how quickly, how easily, how effectually the mutiny among the soldiers was quelled by his patience and faith. I think in many ways, this is like a shield of faith, right? To, to quote that famous shield for David, that they were conspiring to stone him and now they are following him into battle. I think another lesson is there for us, that we should focus on the problems that God gives to us, not the ones that he doesn't. It's, it's not David's concern to worry about what his men are thinking about him, but rather what the Lord is leading him to do. And so they set out there at the brook of Besor, where those who were left stayed behind, but David pursued, and he and 400 men, 200 stayed behind, who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. Now this is about 12 to 15 miles away from Ziklag, where their home was. Remember the length of their journey now. For three days, they crossed 60 miles, to get back to Ziklag. Then they weeped until there was no strength left. Then from there, they set out and journeyed another 12 to 15 miles, all in four days' time. These men are 
exhausted. And this exhaustion is further emphasizing the dependence that they have upon God for the success of their mission. And David is kind to these men because he allows them to stay. They cannot go any further. And here is where you start to see the necessity of God's providential, kind, caring, and guiding hand. That what David and his men are actually attempting to do is very hard. To track down a nomadic group of raiders who came from who knows where and are going who knows where. And there's no indication how far behind they are or how many days journey. And they've now journeyed for four long days. And now they only have 400 men with them and are likely outnumbered. And there is the necessity of God's providence in it all. Jerry Bridges, he gives a description of God's providence. I have it there for you. That God's providence in his con- is his constant care for and his absolute rule over all his creation for his own glory and the good of his people. And, and they are dependent upon that providential hand of the Lord as they are seeking out these Amalekites to rescue their families. And it's there in the midst of God's providence that he provides for them The means of doing that, because you see in verse 11, they found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David and they gave him bread and he ate. They gave him water to drink and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. Sounds like a good meal, right? And when he had eaten, his spirit revived for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. Who is this Egyptian? Well, he is one who was left behind by the Amalekites. Left to die. They wouldn't be slowed down by him. David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, a servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negeb of the Cherethites and against... That which belongs to Judah and against the Negeb of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. Now, you might expect David to kill the young man right now, but instead, what does David do? And David said to him, will you take me down to this band? And he said, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. David is dependent upon this young man And God is providing this young man as the means of his providence to bring David to rescue these families. I think there's an irony here that the treachery of the Amalekites in abandoning this young man is returned upon their own head. It is the golden rule of sorts. So whatever you would wish others would do to you, do also to them. That this mistreated Egyptian left for dead would prove to be the undoing of the entire Amalekite army. And his simple demands are, don't execute me and don't hand me over into their hands. So David does exactly that. And he is brought down to the Amalekites. He experiences great victory and recovers that which was lost. The Amalekites were totally oblivious to all of this. Read with me verse 16. And when he had taken him down, behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. They were oblivious. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. One commentator stated, then are sinners nearest to ruin when they cry, Peace and safety and put the evil day far from them. They are nearest to ruin at that moment. And so they are destroyed. Verse 17, read with me. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day. And not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. Psalm 37 says, says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Later in 
Psalm 37, it says, The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and the needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. And that is what is happening here. And this is the kindness of the Lord that nothing was missing. David recovered, it says in verse 18, all that the Amalekites had taken and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all and he captured flocks and herds and the people drove the livestock before him saying, this is David's spoil. This is the kindness of the Lord. What do they do with the spoil? Will they divide it? Verse 21 and 22, you'll see that the men who were with him were saying, we will not share the spoil with those who stayed at the brook Besor, who were too exhausted to carry on. It says in verse 22, then all the wicked and worthless fellows among them who had gone with David, said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil. Notice this, that we have recovered. The we have recovered is important there. And they are wicked and worthless fellows. I think there's a lesson for us in this, and that is, it is possible to be surrounded by godly men and to find ourselves to be wicked and worthless men. We don't, by default, become those who we are around. So too, we can't assume that our church attendance or any assortment of godly friends or any outward metric will say anything about the real character of our heart. By their greed and their lust, they would swindle their own brothers from what rightfully belonged to them. And they say, what we have recovered. Remember, I made note of that. But David said, look at verse 23, you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given to us. So don't think of it as we have recovered. Think of it as what the Lord has given to us. To summarize the end of this chapter, because we have to get to 31. I'm sorry, gentlemen. He simply divides the spoil and he brings gifts to the elders of Judah from this spoil. I think there's a few lessons. The end of the Amalekites is the end that all God's enemies will suffer. And God is always in control. And the outcome is always certain and sure. His will be accomplished, even if it's hard to see. He often uses means beyond our own ability and strength to reveal our own inadequacies and our own need for his divine strength. Well, that is the triumph of David. And then we see the tragedy of Saul. We'll just cover this in brief. The tragedy of Saul. It is a tragedy because God is shattering and deposing Saul of his reign. You'll remember in 1 Samuel 15, God has rejected Saul. Because Saul has rejected the Lord. 1 Samuel 18, a verse that we've read numerous times in the course of this series. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. And so he becomes an opposition to David. Threat on top of threat, attempt on top of attempt at David's life. Saul became David's greatest enemy. But he also became the greatest enemy of all those who were faithful to God. You remember Saul's slaying of the 85 priests who were stationed at Nob in 1 Samuel 22. And if Saul was David's great enemy, and if Saul was the enemy of all who were faithful to God, Saul was also God's enemy. And God had made himself the enemy of Saul. It says in 1 Samuel 28, given by Samuel, brought back from the dead, Samuel delivers these words to Saul, the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy. Why? Because Saul was a man not of faith, but of the flesh. He served his flesh, and because of it, he became a slave to it. And I would say the same is true for any man who serves the flesh. If you serve the flesh, you become a slave to it. And he was a slave to his own glory and his own expedience. And so the words of Samuel confirmed to Saul what would happen that the Lord had torn the kingdom out of Saul's hand. This is chapter 28. And then in verse 19, it says, 
Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. You will die. And the Lord will give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. This is the cost of godless leaders. There is a cost of godless leaders. They are the demise of all who follow them. And so we see Saul's death, chapter 31. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down. And here's this real sorrow in this passage that we should feel they struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, the sons of Saul. When we think of Jonathan, there's really not a bad word spoken of Jonathan in the entire book of 1 Samuel. He remained, as Dale Ralph Davis says, a true friend to David and a faithful son to Saul for his whole life. Furthermore, the same commentator says, Jonathan laid aside a kingdom that he could not have to enter a kingdom he could not lose. Because he laid aside his own right and claim to Saul, his father's kingdom, so that he might have the kingdom of God. Well, this valiant young man who is in so many ways unlike his father, dies here battling alongside his father. The battle presses hard against Saul. We see in verse 3, and the archers shoot him. They find him, and he was badly wounded. So Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore, Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. Notice the fear that Saul has. He didn't strengthen himself in the Lord. And his greatest concern at this point is lest the Philistines come and mistreat me. It's interesting that his greatest concern is even now still upon the flesh and not upon his eternal destiny, not upon getting himself right with the Lord. He forgets that he will soon be in the presence of the Lord. And this is the blindness of his flesh, that even at death, his concern is over fleshly things and not over spiritual things. This is the pervasive thought that dominates Saul's mind throughout the entirety of the book. The commentator says, Saul died as a man that had neither the fear of God nor hope in God. Neither the reason of a man, nor the religion of an Israelite, much less with dignity of a prince or the resolution of a soldier. He falls on his sword. And this is not just Saul's defeat, but it is the defeat of Israel because they are captured as well. As Samuel had predicted, when the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled and the Philistines came and lived in them. And we are left to wonder, is God really going to finish this book in this way? Yeah, he is. He is. Furthermore, they take Saul's corpse. They parade it around. They disfigure it. They cut off his head. It says in verse 9, they send messengers throughout the land to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to their people. The message is the idols have won. Yahweh is defeated. Saul is defeated. They put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth and they fasten his body to the wall, headless at Beit Shan. His body is then rescued when all the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, these men were actually rescued by Saul. Earlier, I think it's 1 Samuel 11. 
They heard that what the Philistines had done. And by night they arose, valiant men arose by night to take the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beit Shan. And they came to Jabesh and burned them there. They took the bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabeth. And the book ends saying, and they fasted for seven days. There is sorrow at the end of this book. I think there's a few lessons in here. I think one, God will bear with heathens disgracing his name if it means the fulfillment of his will. Because he is moving. God is moving here. Though the Israelites are experiencing defeat, God is accomplishing his purposes and the promises that he had given that Saul would be given over to death. The inhabitants of the, inhabitants of the land are replaced, uh, displaced and God is accomplishing his word. God is God even over the sorrow. And I want you guys to get this. In the same way that God caused David to triumph by his word, he caused Saul to fall by his word. He is in control of it all. And what is he doing? Well, he's preparing his way for the king to come in. He is paving the way for David to become king. So there is triumph and tragedy from above. God is moving. And gentlemen, for us, thousands of years later, the king has come in, has he not? Amen. God is not done accomplishing his word. He is still doing it here. What a blessing this study has been. What a blessing you men are to me. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for uh, the joy of being your sons. May we live all of our days like David, that we would strengthen our hand in you and that your word would reign supreme over our lives. We thank you for your kindness. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.